Good morning. Take your Bibles, turn to John's Gospel, chapter 11. We ended last week with verse 35. We'll start there today. John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. Karen and I have a few Christmas movies we like to watch each year. You know, traditions are such comforting things. Each year on Christmas Eve, and unless we're gone somewhere, we watch the George C. Scott version of Dickens' A Christmas Carol. His, his version of Scrooge is just so mean. Another movie we enjoy around Christmas time is The Homecoming, A Christmas Story. Now, it was a made-for-TV movie, and it was so popular they actually invented a TV series using the same characters. But you probably have to be as old as Karen and I are to remember the Waltons. There's a scene in the movie where a home missionary, we like missionaries, Home missionary comes to their little mountain town to distribute cast-off items as Christmas presents for the poor children. Now, when we put the shoe boxes together, we do not send cast-off items. It's new stuff, neat stuff that a kid can open and say, wow. But anyway, that's sometimes how it's done. But a long time ago, back during, during the Depression, so this missionary, missionary lady comes with these cast-off items for presents for poor kids, and the poor children hear about it, so they gather at the general store, not really to meet the missionary, but hoping for a Christmas present. But the missionary lady wants this to be a spiritual experience, so she demands that every child give her a Bible quote before they can get a present. And that is a problem. One of the girls is a champion Sunday school verse quoter. So she starts whispering verses to the kids so they can recite them and get a present. And, and she whispers a verse to a boy and he says, that's too long. And she says, Jesus wept. So he runs up, says his two words, and gets his present. And that's humorous. But I'm afraid that's about as deep as most people get in understanding that short sentence that John records. Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. And Jesus has come, he says, to awaken Lazarus from sleep. That's what he told his disciples. Now, that's picture language because he had to explain to them that by sleep, he meant Lazarus had died. That awakening, and we'll actually get there today, that awakening will be the last of the signs that John records to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that believing we might have life through his name. Over the protest of the disciples, Jesus has come to this place where death has intruded into the lives of this family that had a close relationship with him. He has witnessed the sorrow of Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary. He has witnessed the loud weeping and wailing of the friends who have gathered around them. And as they lead him to the tomb, he, as Dr. Weiss translates it, burst into tears and weeped silently. These are not the tears of a professional mourner. Remember, they had those in that day. Culture demanded them. It was considered improper if you didn't have them. That's not why Jesus wept. They're not the tears of a sentimentalist. You know, some people are just emotional that way. It doesn't take much to push them over the edge and open the faucets. Now, there's nothing wrong with being easily moved. If you're wired that way, great. There's no great virtue in being cold and unmoved by other people's sorrows. But that is not why Jesus wept. At least one thing we know from the scriptures 
is that he wept because of his mercy and grace for poor, suffering souls. He came to become a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. His coming acquainted him with that experience. So that what he has is not only perfect divine knowledge of what it's like, but the knowledge of actually going through it. He is indeed, as the writer to the Hebrews says, a great high priest able to sympathize with our weaknesses, who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. We can, with confidence, draw near his throne of grace and receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Grace, remember, is God doing beautiful things in ugly lives. When life gets ugly, we need his grace. When we take an honest look in the spiritual mirror, we find that we are ugly. We need his grace. And when we draw near, we find it. And we see that in John eleven thirty five. 35. Rather than looking at us with disdain and well-deserved criticism, seeing our sorrows, he burst into tears. We don't need to be afraid to bring all our sorrows, all our pain, all our burdens to him. He never says, I don't have time for that. He never says, that's too small to bother me. As Peter says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We can sing, I approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious king. And it's not just a song. And he will not just shed tears. He will do something. And what he does ultimately will bring the end of tears. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The most genuine love in the universe. Love which gave itself. Who saw his tears? Well, the disciples saw them. That's why John records them. They're learning who he is. They're learning what he's like. And other witnesses are the ones we might call the spectators, the Jews, the friends who had gathered around Martha and Mary to support them and mourn with them. Verse 36, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. They could see his love, but they did not understand it. They had no grasp of the quality of his love. We, we quote over and over, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But that was not the love that they were talking about. In the English language, that's what we speak, by the way, sometimes, we use the word love for a lot of different things, don't we? Now, the Greek language, that's what the New Testament was written in, was Greek. The Greek language is much more precise. The love in John 3:16, God so loved the world, is the Greek word agape. Now, AMG's comprehensive dictionary says it means to take a deep and caring interest in someone or something. It denotes a deliberate choice originating in the will and disposition of the agent, and it is expressed by action. As you read through the New Testament, that word is used to describe God's love. It's how he loves his son. It's how he loves the human race, in spite of their rebellion against him. And we'll, when we get into chapter 13, we'll find that this word is how Jesus commands his disciples to love. A new commandment. 
I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. There's that word, it's agape love. You also are to love one another. Now, you have to be a Christian to love like that. Now, there, I, there are lost people who are philanthropic, which is another Greek word, by the way. So they, they want to meet the needs of others. It, it, that's a good thing. We get all kinds of appeals during the holiday season, don't, don't we? And a lot of the stuff that we're appealed to give to is, is good stuff. But that's not God's love. There's another Greek word for that, perfectly good, but it's another concept. Christian, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and have been born again into God's family are enabled to love like God, being joined to Christ in his life, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are enabled to be completely taken up with the good of the other person rather than being ruled by emotion. Now, it's not automatic. You know this. Just being a Christian does not make us love everybody with God's kind of love. That's why Jesus had to command it. You have to walk with God and be conformed to the image of Christ before you love like that. We'll look at that more when we get into chapter 13. But here, as John describes the reaction of the spectators who saw Jesus' tears, they, he did not, John did not use the word agape. Now, most of the translations say, look at how much he loved him. That's a perfectly legitimate translation. Remember, in English, we use love for a lot of different things. But John uses a different Greek word than for what they thought moved Jesus to tears. The, the word he uses is, is phileo. You don't have to remember that, but Dr. Weiss translates it. They said, look at how fond he was of them. And that's what John realized. They did not understand what those tears meant. They did not understand how Jesus loved Lazarus. And they had no concept of how Jesus loved them. They thought, look at his tears. He had such feelings for him. That's all they understood. They had no concept of a love that would reach down to rescue enemies and make them friends. Make them, in fact, beloved children. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forever more endure the saints and angels' song. They had no concept of that, and because they only knew emotional human love, they found him rather disappointing. Verse 37. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? I mean... Good night, nurse. My dad says that all the time. He gave sight to a man who was born blind. Nobody ever heard of such a thing. That's amazing power. Like, like Nicodemus said, nobody could do that unless God was with him. But if God was with him, if he's doing amazing things, why did he disappoint us? Why didn't he extend Lazarus' life? Could have, couldn't he? Why didn't he? You know, I think maybe the person who disappoints more people than any other is God. If they believe in him, and I think in their heart of hearts, people really do know he exists. Paul says that in Romans chapter 1, whether they admit it or not. All creation shouts his existence and glory. But if they believe in him, they've got expectations of him. And he better meet them. Extend my life. Make it comfortable. Solve my problems. And if he does not, they are disappointed. And they say to themselves, 
like spoiled, disappointed children. I didn't get what I expected. I guess he must not exist. No wonder, John says, verse 38, Jesus was deeply moved again. Now, we saw in verse 33 that that expression means he was really angry. How could he not be when the people he created in his own image to love and fellowship with him in glory were so twisted in their thinking that they only wanted him to extend their miserable lives and make them comfortable. That's what the human race is like. Paul describes them, us, in Ephesians chapter 2. They are dead in the trespasses and sins into which they walk, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, living in the passions of their flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and are by nature children of wrath, like all the nations around them. No, they did not understand Jesus' love. Love for Lazarus or his love for them? Because his love takes a deep and caring interest in them, in us, in a world of rebellious sinners. It's his deliberate choice, and because of it, He takes action. The action centers on the cross. But before he goes to the cross, he demonstrates by signs, miracles, that point to who he is. He demonstrates that he is the promised Savior. He's going to demonstrate that he is the one they need. He's going to demonstrate that he is the master of death. He is going to demonstrate that he is God. Verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, deeply angry, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Nobody was prepared for him to say that. You don't open a grave for obvious reasons. It's interesting when Abraham lost his beloved Sarah. Uh, he didn't own any real estate at, at that time. God had promised it to him, but he didn't own any yet. So he had to go shopping for a plot of ground. And as he appealed to the people who owned the land, he said, let me bury my dead out of my sight. And that's very plain speaking, but, well, that's how it is. Nobody wants to see what happens to the one you love after death comes. I think maybe that's why I really have no desire to visit my mom and dad's grave. I'm sorry, judge me all you want, and you're probably right. I just don't want to. Scripture does say that death is an enemy. When enemies come, bad things happen. So when Jesus said, Take away the stone, everybody's jaw dropped. You don't do that. And Martha had to protest. Now, Martha was the one who just shortly before this declared her faith and said, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. That's not bad. But when Jesus said this, She said, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. You don't do that. Please understand. This will help you. Please understand that believers' faith often fails in times of crisis. We see that a lot in the scripture. It's the normal human experience of Christians. What you need when that happens is not beating yourself up, but remembering the promises of God. God's people live on promises, not explanations. Verse 40. 
Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? It's a gentle reminder of his promise. See, that, that was the message that he sent back to Martha and Mary when the messenger first came and told him that Lazarus was ill. He said then, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That was a promise. And Martha needed to remember. And with that reminder, she stopped protesting. Verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus, the Son of God, talks to the Father. They, they have a relationship. They, they communicate. He has no problem talking to his father. Nothing ever comes between them. Their communication is never broken except once at the cross because that break took place because the judgment of God fell on the son all who put their faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work on the cross have unbroken access to God. Do you realize that if you're in Christ, your access to God is just as free as Jesus' access was to his heavenly Father throughout all eternity other than that one reality. So what Paul says, writing to the Romans, he says, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice with triumphant jubilation in hope of the glory of God. Jesus talks to the Father. Now, often Jesus would go to a place alone so that he could give full concentration to talking with his Father. But here, he talks to God in front of everybody who is standing around. Why? Well, he, this is what he says as he talks to the Father. I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. He wants them to believe. That's why he says this out loud where they can hear. He wants them to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He wants them to know what's going on. He's, he's going to give them evidence that no one can deny unless their hearts are hardened in a willful refusal to believe what they see with their very own eyes. The sign will say, wake up, people. God is here. Verse 43 when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. One of the Puritan writers that made the cute observation that if Jesus had not named Lazarus in particular, all the dead would have come. After all, the day will come when that will happen. And he came Verse 44, the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This was a miracle. As I study the passage and look at different commentaries, most commentators describe Lazarus as kind of hobbling out under his own power, kind of, kind of like that. But I wonder if Dr. Wearsby isn't right when he thinks that that would not have been possible. Chuck Swindoll points out that in the custom of that time, 
purposes were typically encased in cloth bands soaked in 75 to 100 pounds of perfumed resins. And John specifically says his hands and feet were tied and a cloth was wrapped over his face so that he couldn't see. So how did he get out? Dr. Wiersbe says, God's power must have carried him along. It's a miracle. No human ability needed. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. It was the last of John's signs. He did many signs, but John specifically records seven. Signs that enable us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and so have life in his name. This sign caps them all. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And some who saw it, believed. Verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But, verse 46, some of them went to the Pharisees and told what Jesus had done. This world is not God's friend, and it isn't our friend either. So they went and snitched on Jesus. The Pharisees have got a real problem. Everybody does who does not put their faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 47, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then they admit their real motivation. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They had a religion. In fact, for these guys, that was their livelihood. And that's what they're worried about. They don't know they need a savior. They refuse to see that they need a savior, even though their religion would teach them that if they would just look at it with clear eyes. But God is providing a savior whether they like it or not. There are a few times in scripture when a prophecy is given through an ungodly person. That's, this is one of those times. After all, God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through an unbeliever. Verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, it switched around. Is, is, is you, get, you have to get into Roman politics to understand all that. But that year, anyway, he was high priest. And he said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. If we kill Jesus, it's going to be better for everybody. That one man should die for the people. That is what Jesus is going to do. He's going to die for the people. He's going to pay the penalty that their sins deserve. And anyone who puts their faith in him and in the price he paid on the cross will be forgiven and reconciled with God. 
Peter says, 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit, announces that right in the middle of the council meeting. Verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. These guys are without excuse that's how bad sin is. It shakes its fist in the face of God. Verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. But it's the plan of God that goes on. Nothing can stop it. Because all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And in the face of all this, Jesus keeps right on going all the way to the cross. What amazing grace. Let's worship.